I also wanted a good guy as chairman, to, the, to be appointed by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee for the impeachment proceedings. And so I called Peter Rodino. And I said, Peter, now listen, I got a man I want you to just forget I've ever told you about him. But his name is John Doerr. He's an attorney from up in River Falls, Wisconsin. He is a, his father is a partner of Warren Knowles. And he is terrific. He's got all the, the uh, right credentials. He was the guy that stood in the door out there on the civil rights thing when Kennedy was working for Kennedy. And he's a Republican. But you need a Republican as, as your clerk, chief clerk. So he said, Jesus, I don't know about that, Mel, but I'll look at him. And, and uh, by God, he, he announced about two days later and he said that he, that he had the Republican support of Mel Laird over in the White House. He did that in the announcement. But really, he was a good man to have over there. And I don't know, but in the end, I think Peter Rodino made an excellent choice because um, he picked John Doerr, who was a Republican. And the Republicans picked a Republican counsel. So here we were having an impeachment inquiry headed by two Republican lawyers. Uh, but it was Rodino's insight, wisdom, that led him to understand that this could never be seen by the American people as um, an effort by Democrats to railroad a Republican president. Otherwise, it would never, impeachment would never happen. Uh, as we conclude, tell us, give us a word picture of Mr. Doerr. What was it like to work for him? John was, uh, and, and I would expect still is, very demanding of the purity of the work. He, he, he's uh, uh, intellectually rigorous. He expected us to be. Uh, <coughs> I remember including a fact in a statement of information that I didn't have proper proof for. And uh, he privately said to me, now that we can't have. <laughs> and uh, I, I felt it was a very low moment for me, uh, but, but it was the right answer, I mean. Uh, you, as you said, you had, you'd worked for uh, Senator McGovern's campaign, and I know that Mr. Doerr sought a completely nonpartisan atmosphere. How did he reinforce that, keep the partisanship to the extent it would have been there, out of well, there were, I think, you know, a couple things. First, he, he made very, he was very careful to have people from both parties. Um, and, and so, you know, that we were all working together, we were all a team. And I think the, the example that he and Bert Jenner set, um, I, of course, both of them are Republicans, but, you know, they, they were working very care carefully together. And then I think, Mr. Rodino and Mr. Hutchinson were also working closely together. So you have that kind of, of, of example. Um, the other thing was just uh, uh, the culture. Um, for example, John would never allow anyone to refer to the president as anything other than the president. You know, he wasn't Nixon, he wasn't any of the other names that were being bandied around about that time. He was the president. And, and so, again, to this day, um, I can't refer to Richard Nixon as anything other than President Nixon. Um, and you know, that, that kind of mindset really, really affects how you, how you view what you're doing. And then, of course, it was just it was so important that it, it be viewed as above partisanship. And, and we all felt the importance of, of that as a historic moment, uh, that, that this was something that, that hadn't been done before and, and it had to be done right. And, and so I think it was. Well, he was very, very meticulous about doing that. 
the staff was an integrated staff in the sense that the both <coughs> there wasn't a, min a minority staff and a minority staff at the staff level. I, I had an office that, was, that I shared with someone who was a, quote, Republican appointee. And the staff was, was structured that way on, on, a, on a complete level. Everything was you know, intermingled, the, the appointees, but you also had um, really very careful um, separation from the political climate that was going on. You, got, you couldn't talk to people outside the staff about what you were doing in the sense of uh, a lot of people were very interested in it from, from a partisan viewpoint, both Republican and Democrat. And we, we just couldn't even talk about our work with them. And, and I think we were very scrupulous in that. The staff was housed in a separate area in the old congressional office building. So it wasn't on the Hill. Um, it was um, a pretty confined group of people who stuck together because we, we weren't at liberty to talk a lot about, at all about what we were working on. And, um, and there was, you know, I think in the whole history of the impeachment inquiry, there were no leaks from the Judiciary Committee's impeachment staff. And, and virtually no leaks at all um, in, until the, the hearings became public and people started talking about it. And I think that the nonpartisan character of the staff influenced the committee itself. Remember, the, in, at the end of the hearings, there were a number of Republican votes for impeachment. And I think that. My perception, my perception of the public image of the, of the whole impeachment inquiry was, was very supportive and very um, um, favorable. Well, I think in a way, everybody was on the fence. I mean, none of us, I, I believe, had, had ever studied what impeachment meant in law school. And by the way, I think when I was on the House Judiciary Committee, all the members of the committee were lawyers. We didn't study the impeachment clause. Nobody knew what a high crime and misdemeanor was. was. Nobody had studied the standards. So while we might disagree with certain policies of the president, just disagreeing with policies, is that enough to warrant impeachment? I don't think so. But basically, we all had to immerse ourselves in the evidence. We didn't know all the details of what happened with Richard Kleindienst and the president's involvement with that, for example, all the details about the payment of hush money, all the details about uh, other aspects of the uh, obstruction. So this was a huge studying process. And you know, the, the committee was very, staff and Rodino were very clever about how they got us to absorb this material because they didn't trust us to do our homework on our own. <laughs> what they did was the staff prepared big black books called statements of evidence and they'd have a statement of evidence and then they'd have all the backup for it in that book. And these books had to be locked in our safes at night. They could not be, couldn't give them to anybody. They were top secret and in fact none of this stuff leaked. Which so is all the statements of evidence were read aloud to the whole committee. So no member of the committee could say, I never heard that. I didn't know that. Uh, this was, you know, something that was put over on me. So. Actually, the process was um, a very uh, clever process to make sure everybody on the committee heard all the statements of evidence, had full opportunity to challenge them. And so it was a fair process from the point of view of educating the committee. But it was a huge amount for us to learn. I mean, the backup, it wasn't just each statement of evidence, which was pretty detailed, but it was all the backup with all the detail. And then you could go back to the committee room if you wanted to and read more material, so it was really a huge amount of work. And even before the smoking gun tape, we did get significant bipartisan support in the committee for um, the cover-up article and for some of the other articles too, although I don't remember them as well. Um, 
it wasn't what happened after the smoking gun tape came out and basically all the members were uh, 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 supportive of the articles. But uh, we, this was, we wanted this to be, and John wanted this to be, as I recall, a constitutional process so that you could say at the end of it, the Constitution has a mechanism to deal with abuse of power and subversion of the Constitution in a serious way. And it has a mechanism that works. And the mechanism obviously has a political component in that the public's feeling about how serious this is is a relevant factor and the members know how the public feels. That's their job to be in touch with the public. So it has that component, but it has a component of fact, objectivity, to preserve the power of the president, which is equally important to preventing the abuse of the power of the president. I remember at, 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 in one committee session, we were sort of giving our analysis, hypothesizing, giving our analysis based on other things. This is then, when you put these things together, this will probably happen. And the tapes, it was one of those amazing things when the tapes came out, it confirmed it. It confirmed it. You know, I, I remember feeling so proud that, you know, I, and I wasn't the only one doing this. I mean, others on the Watergate task force were, you know, we, we, we were putting together. Chronologies are very important. John Doe was very big on chronologies, and he was right. Chronologies are important. This fact, that fact, this date, that date, this event, that event. You just, you know, that's how you sort of analyze. And there was a good way of doing it. That was a good way of doing it. Then. And then there was certain lacuna, you know, certain gaps, <laughs> to use a, a famous word. Uh, and we, then we had a choice of using our analysis to fill in the gaps. What the president probably did at this point, what was probably said here, in view of what happened afterward, in view of what was said before, and we sort of, provided that analysis with the committee, even though we didn't have direct evidence of that. And then when the taste came out, the taste provided the direct evidence. It was, it was, you know, I mean, Dean's testimony was very important. Dean's testimony before the Senate Watergate Committee uh, was very important as to the events uh, that occurred. And we, and we used that to help us create this, this matrix of facts. And ultimately it, it worked. It, 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 was, it, was, it was a wonderful process, ultimately. Where were you when you found out that President Nixon was going to resign? We were sitting in our office uh, in, in the Rayburn building, me and the congressman. Had the old TV set right there. And we got a call. Could have been from St. Clair. We got a call from someone that the president was going to go on television. I'm trying to remember, now, 9 o'clock, I forget, and resign. We were just in utter shock. I just remember sitting there uh, that night. Just we didn't know what to say. Nobody said anything. It was just it was just shock. It never entered our minds ever. At least none of the people I. So you thought he would, the president would fight right through the trial. Why wouldn't he? He didn't show any signs. I mean, they just, it just, it was nothing. It was just, it just, it sort of took our breath away. What did this period in your life uh, teach you? It taught me what really good lawyers can do. And, and, and it gave me a sense of, of the profession as, um, as a really fine thing to be part of. Um, and as I said, I think that, that was very important uh, in terms of my career as a lawyer, but it also I, it really taught me, as, as I just said, the, the dangers of uh, one branch uh, of our government, of, of, of the balance getting out of whack. And much of my work as a lawyer since has been working with the legislature uh, here in California and, and, you know, I've really, I think, come to view that branch as dysfunctional as it often is, uh, both here and in Washington, as, a, as an extremely important part um, of, of what keeps us together um, and, and what keeps 
us from having what, what keeps our, our faith. And that's why it's so, um, to me, very uh, disheartening that legislatures in general, our, ours in California, Congress, have, have such low opinion ratings because in many ways they are the, the branch that, in, uh, that needs to keep things under control. Um, and because they have this process of impeachment and share with the courts then the ability to make the other branch um, comply with the Constitution, I think it's, it's just terribly, terribly important. Um, and as a lawyer and as a, as a person who has worked with the legislature all these years, I, I think that the first impeachment um, really taught me the importance of the legislative branch. What did this experience teach you about our system of government? Well, uh, the wheels may grind slowly, but uh, they, they grind pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of force uh, in the law, and uh, it made the president do a lot of things he didn't want to do, and uh, the whole procedure involved um, a lot of things that a lot of people didn't want to have done. But, uh, I mean, there are three countries in the world that I associate with the capacity for self-examination. Uh, one is Israel, one is the United Kingdom, uh, and the third, uh, and perhaps the greatest, uh, is the United States.